precedent of the urban alternative. All the electrical outlets in the world won't do you any good if you never plug your appliances in. Well, Dr. Evans explains today why that's the very problem that keeps so many Christians in the dark. Let's turn to James chapter 5 as he explains. Prayer is the most misunderstood and most neglected aspect of the Christian life. If you want to read the thermometer of your spiritual life, look at the thermostat setting on your prayer life. God has so constructed the world, he has so wired the world that he has said there are many things he will not do in the life of the Christian apart from prayer. There are many things he will not do apart from the dynamic of prayer. First of all, let's look at the priority of prayer. Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. That is, instead of complaining in verse 9, and instead of swearing, cussing, fussing, and making false oaths in verse 12, open your mouth, but not for those purposes. If you are going through affliction, let him pray. Now what's very important is that what God wants as he communicates through the Apostle James is that prayer should be the priority. That is the thing you should do. It should be first. It should be, listen to me, when you are going through trouble, prayer should be a knee-jerk reaction. What is prayer? Maybe we ought to start there. If we're going to prioritize it, what is it that we're prioritizing? Prayer is simply intimate communication with God. That's it. You don't need a $10 definition. Prayer is simply intimate communication with God. Far too many of us want to throw in the towel before we've thrown up the prayers. When you pray, what you are doing is gaining access to grace. We say that again, and it's a foundational statement and why you ought to prioritize prayer. Prayer accesses grace. Prayer does not necessarily mean the problem will go away. Because the problem won't go away until God has finished teaching you the lesson that the problem was designed to teach you. So, he is not saying pray so that you can get a magical disappearance of your problem. What he is saying though is in the midst of your affliction, your trial, your difficulty, pray that you might get the grace of God in order to deal with the problem that you have encountered. Hebrews 4 tells us that God is waiting for us to come to the throne that dispenses grace. When Paul had a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he went to God and said, God, take it away. It's too painful. I'm hurting too bad. God said, no, I've got a humility lesson that I'm trying to teach you, Paul, because of the great privileges that I'm giving you. Therefore, I'm not going to take away the thorn, even though it's sticking you, but my grace is sufficient. What I will dispense to you is the divine energy necessary to deal with the affliction I have you in until such time I decide to remove it. Many of us here are mad at God because he hasn't gotten rid of it and we haven't utilized the grace he has given us to deal with it. Grace is available but only at the throne and you can only approach the throne through prayer. He giveth more grace, James says. In James chapter 4, verse 6, if you will humble yourself and pray. He raises another question in verse 13. He says, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. You having a good day? No trials today? No suffering today? Nothing wrong? Best week of your life? You better sing praises. <laughs> you better sing praises. If things are going well and there is no trauma and things are smooth right now, praise it. Because if he sends affliction to develop you, that's God. And if he sends deliverance to deliver you, that's God. So whether you're afflicted or whether you're cheerful is all God. And since 
presence of our God, you ought to be praying or praising. Therefore, you ought to be in touch with God all the time. That's what he's saying. Whether you're praying or whether you're praising, you're in touch with God. And that's why when you read the book of Psalms, David is constantly meandering to, on one hand, saying help, and on the other hand, saying, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits unto me? He's constantly moving between prayer and praises because he's either having a bad day for which he needs grace or a good day for which he is thankful. If you're having a bad day, you need grace, pray. If you're having a good day, you ought to be thankful, praise. Either way, you're talking to God all day long, every day of your life. You see, what he is saying is maintain ongoing touch with God. Life is filled with days of suffering and days of singing. Job 35.10 says that what God will do when you contact him in the days of darkness is give you a song in the night. So even Paul and Silas who were in jail in Acts chapter 16 verse 25, they were in jail. The Bible says even though they were shackled as innocent people being put in jail, it says in the midst of their suffering, they prayed and sang praises. So sometimes it's not prayer or praise, it's prayer and praise. And in the midst of that, deliverance came. The power of worshiping God through communication. Either way, we are touching base with God. Now, why is it then, if prayer is to be prioritized at this level, we don't pray? Is it that we're bad people? Is it that we haven't heard enough sermons? You know what? I believe most of the people under the sound of my voice today knows that you ought to pray more. If I were to ask you, should you pray more, most folks would say yes. If I were to ask you, do you pray too little, most folks would say yes. And then if I would ask, do you want to pray more, most folks would say yes. Then what is the problem? May I suggest, we want to pray, but we don't plan to pray. And if you don't plan to pray, you won't get it in. Because Satan will make sure you stay busy enough to keep it out. Satan does not want you praying as a lifestyle. He doesn't mind a little quickie at dinner. You know, Lord bless this food to my body in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> he doesn't mind that baby stuff at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to, to take. No, no. He don't mind it. Because he knows in either case you haven't said a thing. What he does not want you to do is cultivating a lifestyle of prayer where you have this intimate communication with God. If you want to go on a summer vacation, you don't pop up the morning of June 1st and say, let's take two weeks off. Is that how you do your vacation? No. You have planned where you want to go, the transportation you want to take, the cost is going to get there, you made reservations for the hotel in which you want to stay. If you want to go on a trip and enjoy the trip, you plan for the trip. Lest the reservations be canceled, the fares be up, the planes be full, the hotels are overcrowded. You plan for the trip. Well, if you want to plan for a trip on earth that is here today and gone tomorrow, how much more should we plan to contact heaven? So let me ask you, what is your prayer plan? Okay. Plan to pray. Don't just wait till it hits you. Now, don't get me wrong. There is such a thing as spontaneous prayer. But there is also planned prayer. And we must plan to pray. Secondly, the people of prayer, verse 14. Here is one of our tough verses. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. First of all, we've got to deal with this word sick. The Greek word here for the word sick is the word weak. It means weak. It can refer to any kind of weakness. In fact, it is used in the scripture of different kinds of weaknesses. Certainly when you're physically incapacitated, the traditional use of the word sick, you're weak, you're weak physically. But I'm sure many of you have said this phrase, I'm sick of being broke. Anybody sick that way?
that way today? Uh huh. And you're really sick too. That's real sickness. Okay? It can be physical, but it is not limited to physical. It means you are encountering what verse 13 says, an affliction. The difference in verse 14 is what that affliction is doing to you. It's beating you down. It's beating you down. It's weakening you. You are beginning to buckle at your knees because of what it is doing to you. Some of us wouldn't call it sick. It was just here today and gone tomorrow. You know, if you sneeze one time, you wouldn't call that, you wouldn't call that being weak. That's an inconvenience. But he's talking about your knees are buckling. The circumstance has weakened you. He says, if the suffering of verse 13 is beginning to weaken you in verse 14, then you're going to need support, help, because your knees are beginning to buckle. Now, if you walk and your knees begin to buckle, that means you need help to stand back up because you're weak. If you are weak, and it can be any kind of weakness that you're suffering, then you are, he says, to call the church. In fact, he says you are to call the elders of the church. That is the spiritual leadership who sits as representatives over the rest of the congregation and your purpose for calling them is because you are weak. You don't believe you're getting through to God. In fact, you may be too weak to even talk to God. And all of us have been in that situation where things are so bad we just don't feel like praying. Or we try to pray and we can't even keep our minds on what we're trying to say. We've just been weakened by our circumstances. He says, if you have been weakened by your circumstances, get spiritual help. Well, Dr. Evans will come back in a moment with a look at how Christians can help each other piggyback their way to God. Right now, though, he's here. In any kind of category, you ought to call the spiritual leadership of the church. And they are to come and buoy you up through prayer. They are to pray over him. And that is because the prayer you could do in verse 13, you can't do in verse 14. See, in verse 13, you're doing the praying. But in verse 14, you're calling for help in the praying because it doesn't appear that the praying in verse 13 is achieving the goal. And you're finding yourself, rather than getting stronger with your own prayers, you're getting weaker with your own prayers. Therefore, you need the prayers of other spiritual people to buoy you up. And then he introduces us to another problem or question. Anointing him with oil anointing him with oil you are weak your knees are buckling you don't know how you're going to make it and your prayers don't seem to be getting through verse 13 and that weakness is getting to you now and, and you need help you pick up the telephone and you say leadership of the church I need help and they are to come and pray over you and then they are to anoint you with oil the Greek word for oil was used of common day rubbing oil it was the same oil that was used to, to refresh a person when Mary put oil on Jesus' feet and took her hair and massaged his feet with the oil that was to refresh him uh, it was used of grooming oil when Jesus told the Pharisees that when you're fasting don't go around looking like you're fasting so everybody will ask why you look like that, you can say, well, my hair's all over my head because I'm fasting. <laughs> Jesus says, anoint your head with oil. Groom yourself up. Uh, don't, don't, don't look like you're fasting. It was used of the oil, also of medicine, because in the Good Samaritan, when he helped the man who had been beaten up by the robbers, he ministered to his wounds, it says, with oil. So it was to assist him physically. That's the word that's used here. You see, they didn't have hospitals on every corner, the doctors that you could call up at the snap of a hat back in the New Testament days. A lot of the things that you had to do, you had to do like your grandmothers used to use castor oil. Remember castor oil? That's called the everything oil. Have a headache? Go get the castor oil. Got a backache? Got some castor oil.
stall in the, in the bathroom. Toenail hanging, get the castor oil. I mean, castor oil was everything. In other words, it was an all-purpose kind of thing. So what would the elders be doing? Were they walking around with cans of oil attached to their belt? No. That word was a word used for the refreshing that would be brought by the elders to bring to bear tangible encouragement, assistance, refreshing, if necessary, grooming, could include medicine to the person who was weak. When you made the phone call and said, elders, I am weak, they came and they prayed over your weakness, but then they found out what they could tangibly do through the mechanism of the local church to assist your weakness to help make you stronger. To anoint with oil meant to provide the tangible touch of that which would help the particular weakness that caused you to pray. Now, if somebody wants me to anoint them with literal oil, no problem. No problem. Okay? No problem because for them that is a symbolism of God and the word oil was used symbolically of the sovereignty of God when they ordained uh, priests and kings. Uh, they would anoint them with oil as a symbolism of God's sovereign choice. That's fine. No problem. But he is talking about the church coming to bear the help, the membership that is weak. That's what he's talking about. And in discussing that, the job of the elders is to bring people to God, but also to make sure that the church has practical ministries that touch the light. Remember what David said in the song, 23rd Psalm? He anointed my head with oil. Now, did God come down and pour some heavenly oil on David's head? No. That's not what he did. Know what he said? He was talking about what David did with his sheep. <laughs> When the sheep got caught in the thicket and they cut their head, he would anoint the sheep's head with oil. He said, God anoints my head with oil. Well, God didn't come down and anoint David's head with little oil. What God came down and did was he encouraged David in the midst of his suffering. He anointed his head with oil by the encouragement he brought into his life. So, the elders of the church are to come and pray, but the elders of the church are also are to bring practical encouragement from the church that they represent to bear in the life of the believer who needs the help. He's bringing the practical ministry of the local church to bear. It could include physical, but it is the practical assistance. I have a friend, pastor friend, a young man came to pray with him who was weak. He was just beaten down. My pastor friend said, let's get on our knees and pray. So they got on their knees and, to pray. And as they got on their knees to pray, the young man climbed on the pastor's back. Literally. And as he wept, he wrapped his arms around the pastor. Because he wanted to be attached to his prayer. He went to him because I'm not getting through to God. Will you get through to God for me? And I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. And he wrapped himself around him. In other words, the church ought to be a place where people can piggyback on one another to get to God. A word to the elders at this point. As I mused over this text. I said we need to provide a practical way for the body to do that. Particularly unless you're... You know, in, in home and you, you, you can't come to church. And so what we will do, men, is provide a way when we're here on Sunday morning for believers who are in this condition to come for prayer as they come to worship. So that we can surround those believers who are weak, who stagger in here because they've been beaten down. And to have some elders who can surround them and hold up their arms like Moses needed his arms held up when he just got too tired. And sometimes living the Christian life just makes you too tired. God says, somebody ought to hold up your hands. The church ought to be brought to bear through its leadership. Now, how are you to do this anointing of the Lord? You're to do it in the name of the Lord. Now, what's the name of the Lord? Is it saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. No, it doesn't mean repeating the name of Jesus. When the Bible uses the word name, it's talking about the person behind the description. Well, my name is Anthony T. Evans, but those words are meaningless unless you have a picture of the person behind the name. It is the person behind the name that gives the word name significance. So when he says we 
ought to pray and anoint oil in the name of Jesus. It is talking about identifying with the person. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say in this situation? It is identifying with a person. It is plugging into his authority that gains access to heaven. It is because of Jesus that we can get grace from the throne. It is because of Jesus we can even get to the throne. And it is our attachment to Jesus that will bring answered prayer to the need. For you not to pray, particularly when you're struggling. And for you to try to fix it yourself is like having a bus that you're trying to push out of a rut when Clark Kent is sitting on it. You're not using the power that's available. The name of Jesus means you have access to a power bigger than your ability to push. So the people of prayer, it's the church through the leadership that comes to bear 